Welcome to Shrewsbury Toastmasters. This is an episode of our Supercharging Your Speaking Skills open house held at St. John's with weekly meetings every Tuesday night at 6.30 to 8.15 in Founders Hall, the boardroom above Founders Hall at St. John's. Please come as a guest, claim your seat, and find your voice. Hello everyone. The most influential writers, writer of English language once wrote, to be or not to be. That is the question. Sorry Shakespeare, that is not the question this evening, but the answer. To be a better speaker, to be a better leader, to be the best communicator. That's why we are all here. That's why we all join Toastmasters. Distinguished guests, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guest, Dr. Hercules, district leader of Europe, welcome. Over four million people have joined Toastmasters to improve their public speaking skills. The mission of Toastmasters is to provide a supportive and friendly environment to improve your public speaking, leadership, and communication skills. At Shrewsbury Toastmasters, we work hard to provide a friendly and supportive environment. Many of us struggled in our beginning to improve our speaking skills. And we are happy that we are here and we want to provide back to the community everything that we receive. Malcolm Gladwell believed that you need to practice 10,000 hours to become an expert in any field. Let this be your first hour of learning to become a better speaker, better communicator, and better leader. Fret no more. Shrewsbury Toastmasters is here. Supercharging speaking skills is here. Like any Toastmaster meeting, we have a Toastmaster who is the MC of the meeting. Today, it is Lyson Ludwig. He is a distinguished Toastmaster. He joined Toastmasters back in 2011. He has been a district leader, area leader, club president, district division director, as well as Condus chair. He passionately believes in youth leadership program to improve the youth's speaking voice. As well as he's a great speaker. He's a Eno fellow, loves reading, loves watching movies and Tamil songs. Are you going to dance Natu Natu? Yeah, Natu Natu. <laughs> Please help me welcome Lyson Gurdjieff. of all time are the aviation movies is Top Gun Maverick. How many of you saw Top Gun Maverick? But the second question I'm going to ask you is, do you know the techniques that you used when flying? We always see movies, we always hear speakers, but we don't understand the techniques. One of the key techniques in that movies, movie Tom Cruise used is called rolling scissors. What that means is the two planes come towards each other and topples down, up, down, 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 and then they come back. And the guy who comes back up with the nose gets the upper hand. How does this do with speaking? 
There are three components of it. There is strategy. You need to know what the opponents are going to do. And there are different types of strategy being used. And it's life and death. So today, one of my goals is try to use Top Gun, the Maverick, and some of the techniques, how those can be a metaphor to teach some speaking techniques. And today, Dr. Jesus is going to take us there. Chaya, if you don't mind uh, giving those flashcards. So you can have some flashcards which uh, Chaya will be distributing. It's always good to hear something. It is something greater when you write it down. I mean, today you might learn many techniques. So it's good to write down on the piece of paper that the flashcards uh, she is going to give you. So what is uh, Toastmasters? Toastmaster was started in 1920 by Ralph Bradley. Uh, he, he saw that people are not scared of death, but people are scared of public speaking. So he started for people so that they can learn how to speak in public. And it has grown so much, there are about 160 clubs even in Massachusetts. And our club is one of the president's distinguished clubs. And it's in Shrewsbury. It's in a conference room right here. So every Tuesday at 6.45 we meet here. If you feel like you want to speak better, it's like going to the gym. It's a consistent process. So today we have a packed agenda. And to put this together, it's always so hard. And we always have a conference chair who takes the trouble to make this beautiful flyer distributed, coordinated. It is none other than I would like to welcome Joel. So what is Joel? Joel has, what is Joel's passion? He's a, he has a three-year-old. He runs around uh, his three-year-old. And uh, the most important thing is, if you ask him what his favorite word in his dictionary is, D-I-S-N-E-Y. His every story has Disney always there. So I would like to welcome Joel, who has been a Toastmaster for the last two years. Come, come here, Joel. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Good evening. I'm excited to talk to you all today about what is S3, supercharge your speaking skills. How many of you are afraid of public speaking? Can I get a show of hands? It's the number one fear in the world, public speaking. Our Toastmaster license just somewhat referred to that. The number two fear is death. So the joke is often that people would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. But it's one of those things where it's so important to learn how to public speak. We use it in interviewing which Dr. Jesus will talk a little bit about later today. We use it when we're meeting new people in the elevator or in the hallway at work. Maybe you happen to be running and riding the elevator with your future boss. Don't you want to know how to spark up a conversation with them? It's an important skill to have. So today we have a great, fantastic group of speakers today that I am so excited to have come up here and share their stories, their experiences, and the skills that can help you supercharge your speaking skills and elevate to the next level so that you're no longer more afraid to give the eulogy than be in the coffin. Walt Disney once said, I can't stand still, I must move forward and experiment. And that's what we're going to ask everyone today to do. Later on, there'll be an opportunity for some volunteers or people that are voluntold maybe, we'll see to speak, and I encourage you to accept that challenge. We're all friends today. We're an open environment to experiment and learn and grow. And that's what is so important about today. And so I encourage you to step out of your comfort zone, enjoy this evening, and welcome to Supercharge Your Speaking Skills. And I hope you have a wealth of experience, a wealth of lessons learned today when you walk out that door. Thank you. Who is the oldest person in this room? That's a very bad question. <laughs> Let me rephrase it. 
Who has been a Toastmaster for 30 years? There's only one hand up. So he is, let's give him a round of imagine, imagine being passionate for something for 30 years. I give it to you. So he is our invocation master tonight. He has, uh, he has been with multiple clubs and uh, he was the president of uh, the Booster Club and he holds a BS and BA in economics and also did a semester in England. He's about, he's about to embark on a European trip with his partner Elaine and he is going to Paris and Barcelona. One thing about Robert is, if you want to learn something today, just watch him. He always comes with a big splash and you see his gestures, everything is so, so much, you just, you should write it out. Oh, Robert did this, let me do that. So let's welcome to the le lectern for this invocation ceremony with a rousing round of applause for Mr. Robert Clement. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests, and welcome to our S3 conference. Spring is in the air, the sun is setting later, and the flowers will be blooming soon. And it brings me to that time in my life that I think about that euphemistical farm way up in the northern reaches of Vermont. There is a dairy farm. And on that farm, there is a big old red barn, fellow Toastmasters. That big old red barn has two little mice running around on the rafters, back and forth and back and forth. <coughs> when the two mice fall into a bucket of cream, they fell into a bucket of cream. Sadly, one mouse dies quickly, but that second mouse starts swimming and swimming, pedaling and pedaling, flapping and flapping, and is able to turn that bucket of cream into butter. I, fellow Toastmasters, am that second mouse. And I'm here to inspire all of you to become that second mouse through the arts of speaking, listening, and thinking. All three vital skills that help promote self-actualization, enhance leadership potential, foster human understanding, and contribute to the betterment of mankind. Amen, namaste, shalom. I think that has most of us covered under this invocation. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Two weeks back, uh, I was doing a speech in Toastmaster and I suddenly got a call from Virginia. So I had the ringer off. I called him back after five minutes. So he called me and said he left Massachusetts about four years back and uh, he wanted to thank Dr. Jesus and me and Pius. So I said, why? So he said, uh, you know, you remember you guys did a youth leadership program about six years back, and my daughter was, came for that, and she never thought she believed in anything. And with that, four Fridays evenings, what you guys did, today she believes in herself. And I said, what happened now? Suddenly you called me. So he said, you know, last week, uh, she got a call from Harvard for the interview and she did the interview, two hour interview. We are not sure that she will get it, but just reaching that stage was something you guys did. So my point to you is, each of you, if you can take part in some youth leadership programs and things like that, you never know, four years later you might get a call and that might be something that gives you satisfaction. 
and the youth leadership program was instilled by Dr. Jesus and it has been going for so many years and he has embraced so many kids. So few words on Dr. Jesus. To me, I consider him a world-renowned speaker. He's, he's a mature, accomplished medical professionalist. Here I see a young man who went to the top-notch school in Massachusetts. I see a young writer with crisp technical writing. I see a speaker with eloquent thunder. And I see a man, in spite of his time challenges, takes always the time and effort to instill in all others the art of speaking. He invests so much time in bringing, the, bringing out the best speaking ability in us. It's my joy and honor to welcome Dr. Jesus. Don't believe everything you say. <laughs> Most of it is not true. Thank you so very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And I want to start by you doing me a favor. Um, can you look around and see the people around you? Imagine those are the individuals that you're going to be fighting for the position that you are applying. That's the competition. The competition is powerful, the competition is brave, they have the acumen, the academic knowledge, they have everything, and you have only a chance for that position. That's the reality when you apply for a job. Initially, when we apply for a job, we think that everything goes perfectly well for us, and uh, there is a change in one of the slides that I think license deleted from the deck. <laughs> <laughs> Let me double check that and see if it's there. Well, it's not there. That's good. Um, so if you actually reach to the point of going to an interview, you successfully went through a set of stages prior to this one that goes and uh, leads you to a face-to-face -face conversation with someone. Maybe that conversation is truly meaningful, it's gonna change your life. It means that you have an emotional work that you did knowing why you applied. You have a wonderful CV. You did uh, a bunch of pre-interviews to understand better what is the position that you're gonna be applying for. And suddenly you get the call and you are in the face of the interview. When you get to the interview, there are basically three big areas that you need to be thinking about. What is the pre-interview job that, or work that you have to do? What is the interview process during the face-to-face? -face? If you're lucky, you're gonna get 15 to 30 minutes to convince that you are the best one, and then what is the post-interview? If we want to play the number game, which part, pre-interview, interview, or post-interview, takes more of your effort? Which one would you think? How much would that be? if you have to throw a number. 10%, 20%, 50%. 90%. Like 70% of your work is there. Awesome. <laughs> That's what I put it there, to make your life easier. 70% of your work has to do with the pre-interview. Only around 35% is actually those 35 minutes, 30 minutes, and the rest, 5% of the run is post-interview. What do I mean by that? If you read there, the top reason why candidate fails, and it comes from a, um, an article just published, and you can see on the bottom line the source of it, is that people are actually not prepared for the job they're applying for. Isn't that amazing? That you apply for a job and you have no clue what is the organization about, what are their values, what they're thinking, what they're looking for, what they're aiming to achieve. Therefore, when you get those hard questions, you don't have the best answers for that um, uh, process. And that's where you start to go down on the, of the failing of, I go to a lot of interviews, I have a strong CV, I'm a good candidate, but I cannot land that position. The second phase is that interview, right? And if you read there, I heard that Amazon interviews were the top. What it means is interviews, and I read more than 100 CVs a year, 
I interview more than 50 candidates a year, and I'm prepared for them. It's my job to get the best talent I can for my team and for my organization. I'm ready for those questions. As soon as I ask the first top questions and they don't know, you know, that's being moves out of the pile. So you have to be really ready for the interview. And we're gonna practice a little bit of that uh, later on the presentation. And the post-interview, basically, if there's something that I want you to remember for today's conversation is to thank and forget. A lot of people get into that emotional roller coaster of, or oh, I apply for this job, I'm gonna wait. That's the worst thing that you can do. You stop when you get the position and you start all over the process to create your CV, keep growing, keep educating yourself. Hanging on one position emotionally is not the best you can do. All right, so how do we think about a pre-interview? And a Talks Master would like three triads, three things, but I'm gonna give you a bonus on the fourth, right? So every slide now, the next three slides will have one to four, and the first three are probably the most important thing here. In the pre-interview process, key here, find as much information you can about the organization. And it's not what is only on the pipeline. You want to understand what are the values, what do they, what type of business they do, how do they do, their business, what type of talent they're aiming for. Because that will allow you to understand whether you are a good fit for that organization. And if you're not, what can you do in the process of preparation to be a better fit? What is the only reason why you go to an interview? To get the job. To get the job, that's your main process. That doesn't mean that you're gonna take the job. That's a different process. You're there just to <laughs> land the job in order for you to have now leverage to decide whether you like the organization or you don't, right? So the first part is you have to understand the position, you have to understand everything about that organization. What is the second thing that I see that a lot of people miss? And that's the most important part that I see failure during the preparation. They don't actually look at the people they're gonna be interviewing with. Do you think that you go to a job interview so they know what is your academic background? Do you think that's why they call you? What do they call you? To understand if they work for them. Yes, but that's partially. What else? They pre-select you based <coughs> on your experience and uh, academics. No, because they already <coughs> look at your CV. Your CV has that information. So if, you, so if you're a cultural fit with the team. That's one. If you're a cultural fit. And second, if you are able to support all that information on the CV in a set of questions that you have during the interview to see if you have the talent that you say you have. Mm -hmm. So the only reason you're there is to establish a personal connection has nothing to do with your CV. You can look at LinkedIn and you get all that information there. And if I don't believe the information on LinkedIn, I can go and try to you know, track back to see and call your past employers and have, you know, take the time to validate that. The interview is a time for connection. So if personal connection is the most important, what would you, you look at the people you're gonna be interviewing with? It sounds a little bit off, but you have to Google people, you have to LinkedIn people, Facebook, Instagram, anything that you can get from those individuals is truly important because you're gonna establish a personal connection. If you don't do that, those guys are the ones that are gonna be called in a, to a meeting and say, hey, we interviewed these five individuals we want you like most. Do you think they're gonna remember the date you finished high school? Of course not. They're gonna remember something personal about you. That's really important. Number three, match your identity as much as possible to the organization. What do you guys think I mean by that? Try to relate your values Yeah, Colorado has to match. But it also can be very superficial. Imagine that I'm applying to be one of the bar tech at Apple. And I go dressed this way. Do you think that works? 
Why it doesn't work? Have you seen the guys at the Apple store? How are the, are they dressed this way? No, they have a ball shirt and jeans and they're very lively and friendly. So if you're applying for that job, you have to look like that job. If you're applying for that, you better know the lingo of that position. So you have to match your positioning as much as you can as the um, organization. If the organization doesn't have your values, you better don't apply for that job because you're not going to have the grit to get to that point. Make sense? Bonus point there for insider information is gold. What do I mean by that? Talk with someone who's already in that team or company. Yeah, talk with someone if you can, but usually, have you applied for a job and you apply for another job and another job and it seems that it's the same job in all across the organizations? What do you think that is? They cannot tell you what you're gonna be doing in that position. Imagine that you're working for someone like Oracle. Do you think they're gonna tell you what they're doing? Something like Moderna or Pfizer or Big Pharma, do you think they're gonna tell you, oh, we want someone that's gonna work in this, 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 and work on this, this, and that. No, it's gonna be very generic. So you need to have information about what the position is all about. And if you get that, and you can include your answers on that vocabulary, in that need, in that challenge that that position has, you're gonna be in a better position. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, number two, and Lyson didn't um, erase that slide. <laughs> All right, this is the slide. You're in the interview, and there are only four things in that, in this slide. Acknowledge the question, value proposition, call to action, and ask questions. The most important are the top three. What do you think I mean by acknowledging the and let me tell you, I'm from that before. Most of the time you ask a question and the interviewee doesn't answer that question. It's unbelievable. You ask the most simple question and they go and answer something else. What do you think that happened? Why do, does that happen very frequently, almost all the time? They don't have a good answer or not confidence in the answer? Or oh, they're very nervous, right? Oh, you are listening. like so there. I want to answer every single question. And what do you think I? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and the person never finished the question. So acknowledge the question. And I don't mean by that. Oh, thank you. That was a very interesting question. You don't say that in a job interview. <laughs> Even if the question is dumb, you answer the question, right? <laughs> Acknowledging the question is. You want to be sure that the question that you're going to answer is the question that's being asked. For example, would you mind if I ask you a question? Sure. That'd be okay. Can you tell me one challenging situation you have had in the last two years at your job and how you solved it? That's a typical job question. What comes to your mind? An employee, a type of employee. So your pulsion was to tell me something about a hard relationship with an employee. Yeah. Was that the question I was asking? Uh, I asked about a challenging situation, but I, I didn't tell what type of challenging situation. So maybe I was waiting for a technical mm -hmm. challenge, mm -hmm. or I was um, thinking more about an organizational leadership challenge. But the question was vague enough that the person said, okay, what comes to my mind is a person-to-person -person relationship and you went to the rabbit hole. That's when you said, okay, let me acknowledge the question. Thank you so much for that question. I want to be sure I am answering the right question. By challenge, you mean organizational, leadership, X, Y, and Z. And the person tells you, oh, what I'm thinking, it's about a technical question related to something that you do at work. Now you're funneling your question and answer what the person wants, not what you think the person wants. You see how different that is? When you go out of that interview, you're sure that you answer the question you've been asked, rather than, I felt it went very well. And at the end, when you get feedback, when you don't get the job, you didn't answer any of the questions, right? So acknowledge, that's key. 
only answer the question that you've been asked. Value proposition, what do I mean by that? What is the value proposition? And I want to be sure I'm on time here, and I'm running very late. But what, can you, what can you contribute to the team? Value proposition means that your experience has some value, and that's what you're bringing to the team, right? All the time you need to bring that aspect to the conversation. If you answer a question only giving facts and not adding your experience, what you have done, what you have to bring, doesn't give you a value to the organization. So value proposition is, that's the time where I sell myself based on facts. And call to action is based on that, based on that challenge, this is what I learned, this is how I will tackle that problem now, and this is how I have improved upon my past. So you're giving a call to action all the time. And that doesn't mean that it needs to take five minutes to answer the question. It can be very brief. You know, this is the challenge, this what the organization needed, this is how we solve it, and this is how we have overcame that problem. Make sense? And ask questions. You know, it's important to ask questions. A lot of the time, people don't go, and you have any question for us? No. <laughs> So how come you're looking for a job? <laughs> you're interviewing that. You know, you're there and you said, hey, I want to know whether you're the best place for me. All right, point number three, I'm not gonna read, you can read it and I can share the slide with you, but the most important is move on. You did your best. Resist the potion to be waiting for three weeks, five weeks for that position. Learn from it. Debrief. Be sure that you are able to understand, I did not too good here, that there was an opportunity here to be a better um, uh, at answering a question, uh, I didn't get the information that I wanted to, you get that into your roster of questions now, but you move on. Going and trying to be waiting for the next eight weeks is not healthy, because maybe you were interviewing number one, and they're planning to interview 15 people from that um, position. You know how hard it is to get all the leadership of an organization to align for 15 people? It takes months. You did your best, you move on and you look for another job. Alright, so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to leave the rest of my slide for the second section of this, but what I want you to remember, slide number two, always answer the question that you ask. So I'm not that question. Value proposition, you're there because you're a professional. You have something to offer. And if you don't have that in your answer, you're not selling yourself. And the third one and last is tell what do they're gonna miss if they don't hire you. This is like, I don't know, like a social media dating site. I want that person. Right, they, you want, is it swipe right or swipe left? I don't know, I don't have those things, but imagine that it's right. You want them to swipe right to you all the time. They need to crave to have you part of the team. And if you do that, your chances of landing the job are much better than 30 minutes before. All right, thank you so much. consistent Toastmaster member. Why do I say that? Every week you can see Kim in come for the meeting. And I really admire consistency. Lately she has been busy, but for the last few years, <laughs> I would say. Uh, she joined in August 2016. She has been a treasurer. She is the president. 
Uh, she likes to read. And one of the few CFOs I have heard in their busy life likes to lead walking trips in the company. I would like to have those type of guys in my company, you know, who take uh, uh, lead the walking trips, walking groups at work. That's an amazing way to motivate your employees. So today, I have to tell one quick story before I ask Kim. So I, I went to YMCA and uh, I was going to put the flyer in the locker rooms. I asked uh, the guy in the reception, can you please put it? He looks at the picture. Oh, Kimberly Anderson, I know her. <laughs> she is the board of go governors in uh, YMCA. So Kim is so socially active in Shrewsbury and it's so proud and honored to have as our Toastmaster member. Welcome, Kim. Welcome, everybody, fellow Toastmasters, our guests, and our esteemed guest today, Dr. Jesus. How speaking skills changed my life. Now, that seems like it might be a little bit of a dramatic result. But there is truth to it. 2016, my boss, who was the CFO at the time at the bank I worked at, retired. We hired a new president. We didn't hire a new CFO. So I was moved up into the boardroom for our senior meetings, even though I wasn't a senior member of staff. The first meeting, I lost my train of thought and forgot what I was going to say. I was devastated because I wanted eventually to be in that room and deserve to be in that room. And I did deserve to be in that room, but I froze the first time I was in that room. How many of you have found that that's happened to you? You get nervous, you lose your train of thought, you can't go, you can't go on, you have to move on. That was the day I made the decision to join Toastmasters. Now I had just recently learned about Toastmasters from one of my walking buddies. And every company I've ever worked at, a side note, I do the walking at lunch. Everybody feels guilty when they don't walk when I'm not there. I really am still walking as a healthy activity during the day. This gentleman worked in our IT department. He and I went for a walk one day. He was talking about it. I'd never heard of Toastmasters before. He kind of explained to it, but you know, I, it was in the past, I didn't think about it until I was in that room that day. I'm like, Toastmasters, I need to join. So Shrewsbury Toastmasters, I went online, like many of you, you Google Toastmasters near you, and I found this club. I was nervous. I would say ums and ahs a lot. I would lose my train of thought, even in Toastmasters as I learned to go through the ropes. But I stuck with it, and I learned, and I practiced, and I started listening to the members in the group that were there before me, pies, lice, listening to them, learning how they speak, what are they doing. I would watch the senior leaders in my company. How are they speaking? And you know what the one thing I found out of every single person in that group? They spoke calmly, slowly. They didn't get nervous. They didn't speed up when they were talking. They took their time to speak. Took a pause if they needed to collect themselves. It's okay to take a pause. Those are things that I learned from observing other members of my staff at work, people that were a pay grade above me, watching what they did, and then coming to Shrewsbury Toastmasters Club to practice. Fortunately for me, practice worked. I didn't get the CFO, CFO job at that company, but I had the skills, and I had good interview skills that I did do some homework before I went to that job, and I got it somewhere else. Because I knew I deserved to be in that room, but I needed to get the practice to get there. So part of the piece with Shrewsbury Toastmasters is why I keep coming 
It is a joy for me, especially with new members, I love to evaluate the icebreaker speech, which is your first speech. Because that's the, that sets the tone of how comfortable you are, you're gonna be a little nervous, you may say something wrong, you may get flustered, but that's okay. This is a safe environment and that's how you learn. I love watching that first speech and I love seeing the result of the 10th speech. It's this program and this process and the practice, the practice, the practice really works. I do volunteer a lot. I do have some membership or some leadership roles at the YMCA, not only in boroughs, but in, this, in the central Massachusetts. I do presentations all the time now. I actually had a presentation at work a couple weeks ago where I gave some financial updates to the entire bank. Now for you, anybody who works in finance, most of the time finance reports are boring. They don't like to listen to finance reports. Do you know how awesome it was for two weeks afterwards that people came up to me that work at the bank? People that are in another department, not the same level as me, came up, I really enjoyed it. You did a really good job. You were clear, you understood what you were talking about, and it just validates the whole point for me why she's why Toastmasters and the Shrewsbury Toastmaster Club is important. I don't always get the, you did a good job anymore. Those are my, my job is to give them out, but to have members of the entire staff at all levels to tell me I did a good job kind of made me feel pretty good, I have to say. So I want to just get everybody, I'm thankful for all of you to have come tonight, and there is opportunities to change your mind. Kim will be standing later to take autographs. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see how much uh, Toastmaster has helped us in our journey, in our career. And we should take few leaps from our journey in our own uh, passions and professions. Some people have a presence. And we are going to have somebody who has a great presence to come in front of you in a few minutes. So what, who is this guy? He is the district table topics champion at the club level. And uh, he has been a Toastmaster not very much, probably under six months, Rafael? Under six months. In six months, he already won championship. And you can see him shooting basketballs and playing games. Um, he does podcasting. He, I don't know what he does not do. But today, it's one of the most interesting part of uh, today's uh, uh, conference. He is going to inspire you by asking you to come in front of the pod here and give you a speech. So before I invite Rafael here, I just want to give one quick intro to Sauji, who is the founder of our Shrewsbury Club. Sauji, please stand up. <laughs> if it was not for Sauji, there is no Shrewsbury Toastmasters. Thank you, Sauji. Thank you. So I would like to invite Rafael to a rousing table topics, and let we can't. I can't wait to welcome you to the lectern. Thank you, uh, Toastmaster. Welcome, distinguished guest. Table Topics uh, Master, it is I, or I <laughs> Anyways, to get started, I do have a lot of questions. Uh, I do want to explain real quick. Table Topics is roughly 60 seconds to 90 seconds. So I'll give you a topic, and then you'll have between a minute and a minute and a half to try to explain, give a story, just say something, anything at all whatsoever regarding said topic. And with that being said, since we do have a lot of members that aren't participating, as well as some guests, I will choose a few members first, and then as a guest, I'll see who 
is in the crowd that is willing, and I'll call you up. Uh, first of all, I'll have Michael come on down. is what led you to pursue your current career path and how has it evolved over time? Thank you Mr. Table Topics Master, good evening fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests, Dr. Jesus. What has led me into my current career path which actually has spanned over 30 years? In fact just a little story about that, a week and a half ago I was at a conference in the higher education industry, is where I've been all of my career. And there was a room much like this, and the speaker was talking to people that had been in the industry, and said, everyone who's been in the industry for five years, please stand up. And then went to 10 years. Those of you that have been less than 10, sit down, went 15, 20, 25, 30, I was still standing. Went to 35, I had to sit down, I admit, but the woman next to me looked at me and said, 30 plus years, and I said, yes. So what, what drove me into higher education? When I was in college, I worked in the college bookstore. And before I graduated that year, I started working full time as a bookstore employee at Barnes & Noble. That started a 30-year career of not just learning about business, by being involved in a variety of university campuses and learning to love how to learn, what people, what drove people to learn, and to be in such a learning environment. That's what's driven me for 30 plus years. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any guests so far willing? Come on down. the most unexpected thing you've learned about your job? Thank you, Table Topics Master. Let me acknowledge my question. <laughs> <laughs> this job, a <or> previous job. <laughs> so, definitely, when I ask unexpected thing, Nothing is coming into my mind, but if I look deeply, one of the questions unexpected was always not acknowledging my question that I learned from this training. So I used to guess and I failed to, I thought I was answering the correct uh, answer. But later, I found myself not selected. But I realized the reason for the I did not acknowledge the question. Because I was confident everything, but no response from the impact. That is the answer. Thank you. Dear Toastmasters, the biggest career risk that I've taken is to lead a team which had no members left in the team. <laughs> Back in 2019, I was working as Amazon integration engineer and the team had none left. We had to launch new Amazon fulfillment centers and none of the engineers were coming forward to launch the building. I said, you know what, someone has to do the job, otherwise 
Amazon will stop building new buildings. I said, I will start doing it. It was not easy. We had spent 18 hours every day to understand what it is because we didn't have a clue what the previous team was doing and their documentation was not great. So we had to build every single thing. After that, I started to hire another engineer who could, who could I trust to build a team. And slowly but surely, now we are a team of nine engineers. And we've broken down into another team called configuration management. So that small risk that I've taken five years now has made me a manager at Amazon. So take risks, and you'll definitely succeed in your career. Do we have two more volunteers? Satya? Thank you. Okay, so if you could have a career change for a day, what would you choose? Okay, we'll talk with Master. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. If I have to choose a career, different career than what I'm supposed to now, I would choose President. President of United States. Why not? It's one day. <laughs> <laughs> the reason because a lot of things we can do. Every human being has their own perspective of how the president should behave. So I have my own way that the president should be like this. So I will take the job for one day and try to do that. Then people may not like it. Some people may like it. It doesn't matter. One day people can survive with me. <laughs> we have time for one more. Does anybody want to come? If you could go back in time to high school version of you, what would you tell yourself to pursue as a career now that you have all your life? Fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests, if I could go back to high school, I think one thing I would do is join a local Toastmaster class. <laughs> <laughs> I remember clearly, before high school, I was not that self-conscious. Somehow, when I get into high school, I became a little bit self-conscious. In one of this school meeting, the teacher told me, you need to say something on the stage. I was so nervous somehow. I found some excuse, terrible excuse. I declined, I didn't go. That memory scarred me for life. So I had to use the rest of my life try to overcome that fear. So in 2018, I joined Toastmaster, Shrewsbury Toastmaster. I started working on that scar. Yes, the foundation is a little bit rocky, the lot, potholes, not leveled. But I think day by day, when I joined the meeting, I laid the foundation on top of that. I think if you look at my speech, my confidence now, it's much smoother. I still need to work on it, but I'm making progress. Thank you. How many of you can remember the technique uh, Tom Cruise in Top Gun used? I mentioned in the beginning. Scissors. Rolling scissors, right? So the rolling scissors, three, three things are there. Strategy, quick thinking, and respond to unexpected situations, right? So what we saw in the last few minutes is strategy. Rafael asked a question, and they answer the question, they thought what to say and how to say it. So in speaking, strategy is so important. 
Today, we have somebody who has been a bedrock of our club to this room. Without her grace and her influence, we wouldn't have this. So, it is my honor to welcome Sarah, who has been a Toastmaster from June 2022. She works for Hanover Insurance. Um, she's a vice president, I believe, right? Um, in her space time, she, in her spare time, if you walk around uh, Shrewsbury and you see anybody hiking or playing golf, that's Sarah. <laughs> but in winter, she decides to hibernate. She likes to have a book and read. So it's, let's welcome Sarah. but it's gonna work. <laughs> Welcome, thank you Toastmaster. Welcome guests. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what I call my life before Toastmasters, BTM, and my life after Toastmasters, ATM. BTM, or before Toastmasters, I was asked to give a presentation at work up there, how hard can this be? I gave a presentation. Guess what happened? I bobbed. I froze. So people gave me some feedback. Well, oh, you should maybe work on your presentation skills. And maybe try Toastmasters. So and so, so and so does Toastmasters, and he's a great speaker. Well, he was just born a good speaker. I can never speak like him. I could never have the confidence that he has on stage. Toastmasters. I do another presentation. Guess what happened? I bombed again. Someone else says, why don't you try Toastmasters? I don't want to try Toastmasters. <laughs> it's not going to work. But I've got to get them off my back. So I said, well, I'm just going to tell my boss. Put it in my review. I went to some meetings, see it didn't work. Fast forward to June of 2022. I come to Shrewsbury, Toastmasters, and I sit there for an hour and a half. I filled the notebook. I filled a notebook with really great ideas and feedback. And one very wise person in that meeting, Pius, said, Moments of enjoyment are when the greatest learning happens. I was having fun. I had fun. That hour and a half flew by. And uh, we were at Zoom at that point, and I walked out of my office beaming, and my husband goes, what's going on with you? <laughs> I was like, I did a Toastmasters meeting. I learned about vocal variety. I learned about how to use hand gestures. I learned about how to tell a story well, guess what happened? In August of last year, I gave a presentation, and I took all of these things that over, I went week after week, and I took notes. I did another presentation. Guess what happened? I killed it! <laughs> I got great feedback. And then I continued to pass that on to people that work for me, and have given them some tips, and someone actually just the other day came up to me and said, I can tell you've been coaching her. You've been giving her your Toastmasters <laughs> skills. So it really took, I was really just convinced that I was never going to be a good public speaker. I'll just ask other people to do all these presentations. And now I'm getting asked to do all the presentations. In fact, I have one on Thursday night I've got to get ready for. And I feel so much more confident. I'm still learning. I've only been doing this for nine months still learning a lot, but I am just so much more confident, even in meetings at work, in interviews, I feel so much more confident and comfortable in my public speaking skills. So it's thanks to Toastmasters and these really wonderful people who are, uh, it's a safe place to, to learn. So I want to thank you and thank you. Sarah used uh, second
second thing what Tom Cruise did, did when his plane was top, toppling down. Quick thinking and using message on the fly. That's the second technique you need to learn. Being a Toastmaster, how it does is when you come every week and think on your feet, slowly it becomes part of your body language. It's part of your quick thinking. So you can't have big muscles by just going one day to the gym. It is a one year, many years process. So I don't want to bore you to death. Dr. Jesus is waiting to teach you the advanced speaking skills. Welcome. Thank you. I can grow muscles on the going one. <laughs> Even if you've been doing public speaking for a very, very long time, most of us live in that 25%. 25% of our skills, 25% of combinations of those techniques, those abilities to put together a little bit of this um, approach and another approach, and that's what we feel comfortable. But that doesn't make you an astounding speaker. Astounding speakers are another breed. They use the technique as a template to drive messages in a more powerful manner. And how, when you tap into that level, is what makes you different, what puts you apart. And sometimes we rely too much on technique because it's the safe zone. When you go beyond the fear, you need to get to the next level of being vulnerable. And if we take the aviation um, metaphor, once you learn how to fly, and if you're an army pilot, you're flying to defend your country. And that's a very different emotional place. Flying is one thing, defending your values and your you know, beliefs is a very different. So what I'm gonna talk today is how you get that 75% down. How to become that individual and understand your capacity and use it on your um, benefit. And this is a very simple slide. It's the only slide that I'm gonna take to talk about how to become a very powerful speaker. And the first one here is to drive emotions. What do you think I mean by that? Drive emotions. You think that Paul was speaking about perfection? Paul is speaking is about leaving a message to the crowd that when you leave those doors, you, you go to your car and turn it on, you're thinking about something that was said a few minutes before. And I was mentioned before, financial Reports are very, very boring, but they matter a lot. So you decide as a speaker if you want to make it valuable and emotional for people or what you just want to make it about the numbers. So being emotional, it's key for public speaking. And the only way for you to get emotional is that you have to be vulnerable in front of individuals. If you don't want to pay the price to be emotional yourself, no one is going to open the heart to your message. So that's number one. You need to write a speech with the only intention to drive an emotion rather than to drive a message. It's very different. Number two, you have to find meaningful examples. And I think we always try to find examples that resonate with us. Because maybe I'm a pilot and it makes sense for me to talk about engines and things like that. I'm not a pilot and I don't know anything about that. Right? But if it's meaningful for the audience to talk about airplanes, you have to do your research and you have to drive your point of view, your emotions, your message to something that is meaningful for people. The thread of this conversation today has been professional, job hunting, that type of thread. So if you're going to talk to this crowd, you better think about something that is meaningful for them. Otherwise, you're disconnecting yourself. 
So you have to know who they are, what they want, what they like, and in order to you to find the voice and the message that makes sense for them. Number three, you have to show vulnerability. What do you think I mean by that? Cry. That could be one. <laughs> you could cry. Be, be authentic, be honest. You can be honest. You have to be authentic. You have to give you permission to make mistake in front of them. Otherwise, you're like a bulletproof robot that can do everything. That's not what it's all about. The best speeches I've seen are not the best executed speeches. They don't follow the rules of, you know, three examples and don't move here, move here, spend 30% of your time here, 30% of your time here. We know all those techniques. But the best speeches, I knew nothing about that. Had filler words, had stumbling. <clears throat> You know, the person stayed frozen for 30 seconds, and that was okay because they needed to cry. But the message resonated with everyone. And that's what you want to aim as a professional public speaker. You have to be vulnerable and tell people, I failed. I left, but I failed. If your voice cracks, it's okay. If your body language is not the most you know, eloquent, that's okay if the speech needs to be. The thing is that you have to make that a choice, not a consequence of your message. You have to go to the stage and say, I'm gonna do it that way, because that's the most powerful way to drive my message. Vulnerability is a choice, it's not an outcome. Go type public speaking, what do you think I mean by that? To be a good public speaker, you have to be outside of public speaking. Be personal. What's that? Maybe personal, be personal. <coughs> Could be. Think of more about technique. Think about places where they're, you know, oh, let's, let's say Oscars. Who are the guys that actually host the Oscars? Are there public speakers? Actors. Usually not, right? Yes. Actors. They're actors or humorists or other individuals that do something else for a living. Why do you think they're selected for that? One is fame, connection with people and so on. Is that they have to, the ability to think on their feet and if people are not reacting or there's a slap, on the crowd, they know what to do. I started public speaking around 2006 because I, as you can tell, I'm not from here. You know, my accent is not from Shrewsbury, it's from Framingham, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and so told, told me, if you want to be a better speaker, you have to do acting. And I took it seriously, and I went acting. And I've been acting for the last 10 years. <coughs> Someone said, your accent is awful. So I took voiceover classes. Then I took speech therapy here in Worcester to reduce my accent. I had to apply a lot of techniques outside of the classical public speaking to get to the next level. Acting is not about only the words. It's to be faithful to those words. I went to comedy school for two years to learn improv the hardest things I've done. I didn't grow up here. I don't understand American humor. I was a fool for two years in front of a stage of people, and they thought it was hilarious. How come you think about that if they're talking about some other topic? Well, that's what I understood, because I don't get the nuances of the cultural differences of what humor is all about. I suffered for two years, people had fun for two years, <laughs> but that was important for me to become a better speaker. So find those opportunities outside of public speaking that can make you better. It could be writing, it could be a poetry class, it could be anything outside what we learn only in Toastmasters. But use that and bring them here. This is the place where you play and see that work for me or that doesn't work for me. Express more with fewer devices. What do you think I mean by that? 
Have you ever fired someone? You know how long those conversations take? Seconds. It's awful. Imagine this situation. I have this presentation of 120 slides, just to let you know that I'm going to let you go. Would you sit through that? <laughs> no way. Better speakers use slides with like only two or three words. I invite you, go and watch a tech talk. How many slides have like a bunch of bullet points and all these letters? Very few of them, if any. You have to learn to say more with less. And that, what we just practiced here, 60 seconds to tell a story, that's truly really powerful. Because that's how we communicate now, with less. You have to be very powerful with very, very, very small amount of words and time. And finally, build an arsenal of stories. What do you think? Stories. Why is it important to know them? Demonstrates your point. You still demonstrate their point, that's one. Connect with all. Connect with the audience. We are emotionally trained to learn from stories. So if you can learn a bunch of stories and use them as a way to drive a message with color, with smell, with light, with those devices that we don't use all the time, it makes you a better speaker. So those one who actually take the time to learn 50, 100 stories, like a humorist, right? They learn all these jokes, and they have them ready. If people are not reacting to me, I'm going to throw this one. If that one is not resonating, I'm going to throw the other one. Until they find the ones that is the story that connects with everybody. And when you're there, you grab their attention, and they become part of you. And they don't, they don't want you to go. Tell me another one. Tell me another one. We've been training kids for the last, I don't know, 10, 10 plus years? Prima, 10 plus years, we've trained over 800. And we always finish our classes with a story. So let me share one to finish. I remember the first time I lost a patient as a physician. I was an emergency doctor. I remember the dad walking up the emergency room holding a young man, around 16 years old. When I saw it from afar, I could see that his body was lifeless. <coughs> I tried my best. I truly did. But I couldn't save him. I spent five minutes looking at the wall, away from the body trying to find the best words to tell dad that his son has passed. I couldn't find any word. I went through all my medical training. Where is the class? Maybe I missed that one. When they teach me how to say this in a way that is not that bad. And trust me, there's not a way to say that in a soft way matter. It's going to hurt. It sounds cliche, but I walk out the emergency doors. I look at him, and I said, I try my best, but I couldn't save him. I was expecting him to have this rage and, you know, an emotional display due to the fact that the sun passed away, but he didn't. He looked at me and he said, what hurts me the most is that I never told him that I loved him. What hurts me the most, I come from a place, Venezuela, the way you say hello to your relative, the ones that are under your tree, it's a blessing. Bendición is the word. And when someone says bendición, you reply, que Dios te bendiga, God bless you. That's the way we say hello. So he said, I couldn't say goodbye to him and give him a blessing. I didn't have anything else to say 
and I just opened the doors of, of the room. I said, please, you can go out and say goodbye now. Well, I learned that day is that words matter. That words are important. Instead of him crying because he will never see his son grow, what he was, was heavy about is that he couldn't say things. So every time that I had a patient that was very close to that moment, I would call all the relatives and say, you know what? Please go ahead. Say your goodbye. Take the time to say whatever is in your heart. Because maybe this is the only time that you have the ability to do that. We'll have that moment in our life where everything that we have is reduced to a moment that we can only say words. So you would be better ready to be emotional, to find the right examples to drive that message, to open your heart and be vulnerable, to go outside of the technicality and perfection of words and say what is in your heart. Express more with less, because that moment requires so. And please build stories with your loved ones, with your friends, with your neighbors. Because at the moment when you need to say goodbye, you better say blessings to yourself. And go wherever you're going to go. But with the happiness that you have said everything that you have to say. Thank you so very much for the invitation. It was Let's give a standing applause to Dr. Uh, so now we will invite uh, all the office bearers to come forward. So okay, can all the office bearers please come forward so you know all the office bearers and uh, You want to introduce the opportunities? That's a sad You know what? I'm going to delegate the duty because I may not do a good job. So I would like to invite Vijay, Vijay to do the introduction of the officers and about the class. Uh, he has a four year journey uh, with various officer, officer roles in Shrewsbury Toastmasters. And um, Vijay, at, uh, I can't read my own handwriting. That's the bad part of life. <laughs> Vijay has uh, Vijay has his growing skills to uh, learning from all the wonderful Toastmaster members that is surrounding him. When not having uh, his skills, a Toastmaster, when not working on his skills, a Toastmaster, he makes sense of the world through books and hikes and test his limits. Today, I welcome you to test your limits and invite and introduce each of these members. Vijay, please take this. Thank you, Toastmaster. Hello, Toastmasters, former members and guests. Today, we witnessed a lot for the hour or so. What if I said, you can be one among them. Is it a sales pitch? Let's find out. You witnessed it. And what is stopping you? Nervousness? If it is nervousness, then I can assure you that we cannot cure your nervousness. Then why do I join? We will support you to become a confident speaker to overcome that nervousness and move forward. As we are saying this, everyone are nervous inside, but still we are able to speak. That's what we can get. How? By coming to our club meetings every Tuesdays at 6.45 p.m. Where does this happen? It's a stone's throw from here. The first building to your right 
when you enter St. John's, it's at the Founders Hall. All you need to do is just walk up the second floor or take the elevator. Right at the entrance, you will find a meeting room. And all these wonderful people ready to welcome you and support you and mold you into a confident speaker whom you can witness where once Toastmasters who walk through the doors. And now, our club is led by our great president, Pius. <laughs> the reputation of our club is that we have five years as a distinguished president club. That is our Pius did maintain that. Pius is supported by the Vice President of Education, Jim. <laughs> when you join a club, a sense of mentor takes you through what you should do to come up in your Toastmasters journey. And next is Dinit our youngest member of our club, who joined the club a year back, and now she is the sergeant of arms. <laughs> she takes care of all the club needs to conduct a successful meeting every week, supported by all the members. She's in college, but still she takes time out to attend most of the meetings and her progress is something that is amazing. And you would have heard a joke or a humorous talk from this guy, who is Satya, who is our secretary, who captures our notes and sends wonderful moments of the meeting every week. Even though if you miss it, you're not going to miss much because his notes keeps us updated. For the meeting to happen and to reach your ears, it was the guy responsible for the flyers, responsible to get the word out and get you all here. Supported by others, our VP of PR, Joel. And the fun part, when everyone talks about finance, <laughs> it's money, right? Now, how much it's going to cost to join those masters? Is it a lot? The less? <laughs> he can talk about numbers. But I can assure you, it's definitely not costlier or more expensive than a cup of coffee you drink every single day, irrespective of whether it's Starbucks or Dunkin'. <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> Our club treasurer, Mike. Introducing all the members is myself, the VP of membership, Vijay. <laughs> With that, we welcome you all to our club and to see many of you all try us by being a guest. It's not going to cost you anything. You don't need to be a member to join our club. You can attend unlimited meetings think whether it is for you and then make up your mind. Thank you very much. So coming back to your original, we are almost at the end of our meeting. I know you guys are ready for dinner or so, we start with the theme of rolling scissors. We found strategy, quick thinking. And the last, the third part Tom Cruise did was the ability to adapt to unexpected situations. So, Dr. Jesus showed us how to adapt to unexpected situations. We always think to be perfect, but Dr. Jesus told us, you know, the beauty of life is not to be perfect. 
You used to show your vulnerability, show your emotions. See, the most important thing between a speaker and the audience is the connection. When you show that you are vulnerable, people listen to you, your credibility increases. So, the last part of the uh, Rolling Scissors technique, the maneuver, when he comes down, he creates a moment of confusion. A good speaker needs to create that impact for the audience. And these techniques will make you to create the impact for the audience, imbibing stories and different techniques from different places. So it's my joy and pleasure to have so many wonderful speakers and to come here. So before I close the meeting, I would like to welcome our fearless leader, Mr. Pius, to say the last hooray. As soon as he finishes, please, all of you come here. We want to take a group picture of your wonderful faces. So tomorrow morning we can say, I know them. <laughs> Thank you, Lyson, for that wonderful job as the Toastmaster this evening. I really enjoyed the meeting, the great speakers, Dr. Versius, Joel, Kim, Raphael, Vijay, and of course, Robert. I learned so much from all of you. Building an arsenal of stories, I have a killer story. <laughs> This is about Dr. Hussius. When I competed at the district level humorous speech contest, Dr. Hussius spent so much time working with me just on the introduction. The first two, three lines, it took over an hour. And I'm thinking, oh, MG, he has so much patience to work with me. I remember one particular sentence. Two maids washing. Who else? Coming to America, what's the star's name? Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. That particular sentence, he spent so much time over and over to make it impressive, make it so capturing the audience. So I'm inducted to him, working with me, on that speech, and I was able to get to district level and compete on that speech contest. Finally, the only advice that I have for all of you is that if you're working with Toastmasters or even outside of Toastmasters, the best way to make improvements to get to where you want to be is to take small steps. Set a small goal. One or two goals, work on those. What I mean by speaking goals or Toastmaster goals, how to improve your introductions, how to close a speech, how to organize your speech, how to improve your hand gestures, body gestures, feelings, facial expressions, Vocal variety, how to speak fast, slow, all of that is part of vocal variety. So set small goals, one or three things, one or two things, and work on that for three to four months. Then work on the next set of goals. That will definitely help you. Like Malcolm Gladwell said, small critical steps will get you over the threshold. With that, I'd like to invite all, invite all of you to come up here to take a picture. Thanks for attending. Thank you.